Ooh. We are back and we are live. It is Fight IQ presented by Rotowire MMA. And on deck, we have UFC Boise. Welcome back, everyone. I am your host, the Daily Fantasy Sniper, along with the analysis, the stars of the podcast. It is Sun Tzu and Chris. How are you guys doing today? Wow. I mean, it, last week was such a dumpster fire of a card um, that I seriously thought about stepping away um, <laughs> for a, a, a hiatus. Um, uh, and, uh, I hope this card is better. I like, I feel better, a little bit better now, but I think this is a solid GPP card. I, I, I agree with that take. Cash is, cash is a little tricky and there's, there's some interesting fights in, on this card. Uh, Chris, how, how are you liking this card? I, I like it just fine. I, I mean, I'm just glad to see that Joe is here. I was afraid that this would be a two man ship from now on with, uh, with, I was, re- I was ready, dude. I was so depressed after watching that Nganu fight. But you know what? I, I kind of I kind of respected him when he said, "You know what? Look, I was scared. I admit it. I was scared." So you know what? We'll see what happens going forward for him. I'm interested. Now I could be mistaken, but me and Chris were talking before the episode. We couldn't remember what my hot take was because his hit with with Pettis getting a submission. No time. One of the things I was debating, and I could be wrong. I don't know if this is what I picked, but DC was a knockout. We got a champ, champ. Ooh. DC, all, champion. all kinds of power. My, my I, I think the only thing I got right was Emily Whitmire, but I'm pretty sure that was not my hot take. Yeah, I can't, I, remember. I, I can't remember. I couldn't remember mine either. I know where I was on. I was on DC, but yeah, I, Whitmire, I sure. Whitmire was the only thing I got right. I'm just going to consider myself the reigning defending champion, if it's okay with you guys. Of the hot takes. I, I mean, of the we hot will, takes. we'll see how how this card goes. Speaking right. of this card, we should get into it. It's UFC Boise. As I mentioned, the main event is Junior Dos Santos taking on Lagoy Ivanov, I believe. And I don't think I butchered that last name before we get into the picks. You know what? I meant to, I meant to say this in the open. I got to remember to start tagging. It's Fight IQ presented by Rotowire. I'm going to start calling it this. This should be your source for daily fantasy sports MMA. So these are DraftKings specific picks. If you don't already know, uh, make sure you go to rotowire.com slash free. Check out all their other content in all both fantasy and season-long sports. Try all their content for 10 days free. No credit card required. I'll do the quick follow all of us on Twitter. Chris is at Real Chris Olson. Joe is at Sun Tzu. I am at the DFS Sniper with one S. Enough of the pleasantries. Let's get into the fights. Wait, 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 wait. By the way, did you guys get that really cool – um, book in the mail from Rotowire on on the on fantasy football. That really cool, like uh, seasonal magazine that they put out from Rotowire. That oh, is, yes. yeah, that is so cool. Oh, God, yes, Sean. I didn't get it. What happened, Jake? Jake. Oh, I don't know, Jake. We got we got. It. But that is like again, you know, we we everybody knows we work. We're all about the soft dollar credits here, and like getting like cool things like that. And I'm waiting for my Rotowire truckers cap to come I'm in. Still waiting for my shirt or my hoodie. Yeah. I don't know if they have a big enough hoodie for me, but if they do, um, I definitely will wear it on the air. Um, we are we are all putting Jake on on blast uh, here, so on notice. Jake, hook us up. And did we get invited to the Christmas party? I mean, I don't even know. We got to figure that out. Like uh, a holiday party. I'm sorry, not invited too much. I do not. I do not mean to be politically incorrect, so I'll say yeah, holiday Joe. party. Yeah. Uh, holiday. Okay. Okay. On to the fight. Speaking of politically incorrect, there's plenty of ways to kind of lead in here because we have Joe, a rematch of a fight that was called off for chapped lips. That's not what chapped lips you know, has a whole new meaning. Jody Escabella, 8,300, taking on Jessica Aguilar at 7,900. For me, Jessica Aguilar is a pioneer of women's MMA. I think she's over the hill. I think she's one-dimensional. And while Escabella isn't great, I think she'll have enough to out-volume her way to a decision. That being said, I think the fight is doo-doo overall for, for DraftKings, and that's how I'm handicapping this one. Joe, as we all know, we mention every week, and we'll mention three times this week, you are the women's MMA whisperer. What do you got for us? Yeah, uh, the only thing I got right last week was Emily Whitmire. Um, look, you said it. You pretty much summed it up in terms of this not being a great fight to target for DraftKings. I mean – I will say up front, I feel all of the women's fights this week are not great fights to target for DraftKings. Um, as it relates to this fight, um, both women come from good camps. You've got um, Escabel at Jackson Wink. Uh, Escabel, by the way, if you are a, a, a longtime MMA fan, 
Escabel is the wife of the Dean of Mean, Keith Jardine, um, you know, uh, who's actually probably making more money as an actor than he ever did in MMA. Um, in any case, she's Jackson Wank. Aguilar is American top team. Um, my issue with this fight is that Escabel is a natural Adam's weight. Adam weight, for those of you who don't follow Invicta, is 105. Um, there's not an Adam weight category in the UFC. Um, arguably, Escabel's best win um, in MMA was against uh, Yin Frey, who is is uh, an Invicta fighter, uh, I believe, Adam weight champion or former Adam weight champion. Uh, Aguilar, she's five foot one. Aguilar is five foot three. Not exactly tall either, but I see Aguilar as having the experience and strength edge in this fight. I think she will get a couple of takedowns. Um, I will give Aileen in this fight to Aguilar. Um, I don't expect it to be an overly exciting fight, and it is not a fight I would target for DraftKings. Chris, what do you got? Yeah, um, I'm not going to spend too much time here because, in fact, we covered um, this actual fight on our pod um, before it was canceled. But uh, just very, really quickly, um, I like Aguilar here. I, um, I, th I think her pressure is going to get it done. I think she's going to... Pressure, land enough overhands, get to her takedown, be able to rinse and repeat enough. Um, Escabel likes um, those counter hooks, but I just she doesn't hit very hard. We know how tough Agu Aguilar is. I think she's going to hang in there. I think she's going to make it dirty, and I think she's going to get a win. And she could get enough takedowns to at least be a cash play, but uh, – I pretty much agree with you guys that overall this isn't a great fight to target for DK. And I, and let's get we I don't know if we gave the uh, salaries. I believe Escabel is the highest priced of all the six women's fighters. No, I think this is eight three and what seven eight. Eight three eight three and seven nine. I, I seven, did give nine. the price at the beginning. The the cat and Renault fight is I know is eighty one hundred a piece. Scrolling real quick to find the other one. I'm pretty sure Escabel is the highest price. She is. Carmouche is 8,200. Maya is 8,000. Yeah. Which we'll get to. So yeah. that's this. You might want to fade the mid range this week, although I have one exception that me and Joe pretty vehemently disagree on. So I can't wait to get there. But until then, let's see if we can find a better scoring fight as we look towards the flyweights. Elias Garcia making his UFC debut. He is 8,600. Taking on Mark De La Rosa at 7,600. The husband of Montana De La Rosa, who got a win last week, he is making he is having his second UFC fight. His debut was a short notice loss to Tim Elliott, where he did not look good at all. Elias Garcia is from Rufus Sport. Uh, the UFC has him at three and zero. I believe he's five and zero. I saw on Topology, um, pretty well rounded. You know, typical Rufus Sport guy. You know, it reminds me a little bit of Sergio Pettis, not as flashy, the striking, but Throws the leg kick, seems well-rounded. I have this one priced pretty even because I can't get a really strong read in either guy. They're both, to me, guys who are okay everywhere. If there's an advantage, I think De La Rosa might be a better grappler, and that's why I'm leaning that way on DraftKings and because he's cheaper. Um, and up in that range, I have other targets I'm more interested in than Garcia. So for that reason, I'm kind of leaning De La Rosa as a DraftKings play. Chris, what are you thinking? Well, the first thing I have to say is uh, there might be a reason that he reminds you of Sergio because he is the cousin of Anthony Pettis, is Elias Garcia. And, um, you know, uh, maybe share some of his traits. Uh, you know, I, he likes to work off his back. I think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much with you. I, I don't really have a strong lean either way here. Both of these guys are, are pretty similar in that they're both top position grapplers who can't hold position very well. Um, I think Elias might have the worst fight IQ. I mean, he literally pulls up opponents on top of him sometimes, uh, which you should never do regardless of how good uh, your bottom game is, unless maybe you're Damian Maya. But otherwise, uh, you shouldn't be doing it. I'm going to lean De La Rosa here too because I think um, they're both grapplers, as I said, but I think De La Rosa is a bit cleaner uh, striker. I think he keeps distance uh, better. He's got a, a good counter hook. Um, he comes forward, he pops a nice jab when he, when he feels like it. And, um, you know, both of these guys could get caught uh, working off their back. So the first takedown could, uh, could mean a lot here. And so, again, I'm not really gung-ho on anybody, but I'm going to go with a gun to my head to De La Rosa. Joe, are you going to make it the very unconvincing, not confident, clean sweep? 
Pretty much. I mean, I, I really don't understand why Garcia is the favorite here, unless it's, you know, Pettis, Rufus Sports, recency bias. Um, you know, I, I, as good as what you can, what you, what you can say about a guy that's actually coming out of a quick short notice loss to Tim Elliott is he didn't look awful. And I know that that's like, that's a stretch. Um, I see this as a pretty even fight. I think it's minus 135, minus 140. I just looked a few minutes ago with uh, Elias being the favorite. I think there's odds value on De La Rosa. I expect him to be pretty popular on DraftKings. He's attractively priced at 7.6K. So, yes, I, I might like him a little bit more than you two, and that is my pick. All right, next up, back to the women. We have Liz Carmouche, 8,200, taking on Jennifer Maya at 8,000, the first of two times on this podcast. I'm going to say avoid the name confusion. Uh, Jennifer Maya is not at all related to Damian Maya. She is a kickboxer, different game style, you know, totally different style. And Liz Carmouche, to me, has the strength advantage. If she can get this into the clinch, I think she'll she'll be able to get a couple trip takedowns. Uh, and win this fight. The problem is, if you're high on Carmouche, if you agree with me, even in her wins, she doesn't score well. In wins against Caitlin Chukagian and Lauren Murphy, Chukagian, she had four takedowns, only 67 points. Lauren Murphy, two takedowns, 62 points. Those are DraftKings wins. So it's really hard for me to be to want to roster her, even though I think she's going to win. Maya, you know, maybe in the clinch, if she keeps it at range, she's the better striker. And maybe in the clinch, she finds the pump clinch, lands some big knees. But overall, another fight that, as I know Joe agrees, because he mentioned in the first fight, that I do not think is good for DraftKings. But my pick is Carmouche. Uh, Joe, anything to add there? Yeah, I'm going to go the same way uh, to your point and, and to my original point. I would not recommend targeting this fight on DraftKings. Um, I have seen several of Maya. Maya, uh, Maya is, is kind of like Smith in, in Brazil. Um, you know, so it's a fairly common name. There's also a referee in the UFC with the last name Maya, anecdotally. Um, so I would, uh, again, I think Carmouche will have the strength advantage. She's faced better competition. I've watched some of Maya's fights in Invicta. I believe she was actually a champion in the weight class. Um, but I do expect Carmouche to have um, a pretty significant strength advantage. Um, again, I am going under the impression that she's not a shot fighter. Um, you know, she looked okay. I have not seen the formal weigh-ins. I saw the, the stare downs, you know, they both looked okay. Um, again, a lukewarm endorsement for Carmouche, uh, a better fight to that than to play on DraftKings. Um, Liz Carmouche. Chris. Um, I'll go a little bit, a little bit warmer than, than lukewarm, although still pretty tepid. Um, I, th I think that, uh, Maya might be the better striker technically, but she also leaves herself open more, I think. Um, she got cracked really hard uh, in her last Invicta fight more than once because, I mean, she looks to counter. She's pretty much the ultimate counter fighter, but when she opens up, she leaves herself open, so she's open to get cracked. Um, she likes to hang out in the clinch too, but if she does that here, as both of you guys, I think, alluded, uh, she might be in trouble because I do expect Carmouche to be stronger. And um, I thought I thought Carmouche looked okay in her last fight against Alexis Davis. I just thought, you know, she wasn't she wasn't paying any heed to the submission attempts whatsoever, um, which uh, could be dangerous. Don't really expect Maya to try anything, but she could. I mean, she's I've seen her switch her hips and try for arm bars and stuff, and lock up like half-hearted triangles. So you know, we'll have to see. But um, overall, I think that you know Carmouche, she's not really a technical striker, but she's got. She, she can hit pretty hard for the weight class when she does connect. Um, she does like throwing that overhand right. So um, I wouldn't be surprised to see her hit Maya with something hard here. And overall, I expect her to win the wrestling exchanges. But, um, yeah, I think um, this she probably shouldn't score that well. And so I would say maybe drift off it, maybe get a couple in there for Carmouche just for, you know, the, um, the veteran fighter. Uh, next up, a fight that I have a, a pretty strong take on, and there's already been a little bit of chat um, on YouTube. If you're listening to this after the fact, we do these Friday nights, usually at 8 o'clock Eastern, stream them live on YouTube, hop on there, ask us any questions. I've got a couple lined up, a couple comments. It's also one later about the Miles Jerry fight. If I happen to forget, guys, please remind me. But up right now, 
we have Kurt Holaba at 8,800 taking on Rioni Barcelos at 7,400. Kurt Holaba, as our, our friend from Roto Grinders, Brett Appley, mentioned in the chat, that Holaba does have the second highest inside the distance prop on the card, and I absolutely hate him. I, I have no interest in Kurt Holaba. I don't think he's very good. He's a CES guy. He's been in the UFC before. Even if he wins at 8,800, he's going to need – and his inside the distance props is second highest in the card. I just, from what I've seen on tape, I personally don't agree with it. So it's probably my strongest outside the, the main mainstream thinking. But Barcelos, I think, is definitely stronger, has, has the one-punch power if Matt Halibut tries to walk him down. Counter strikes pretty well from what I've seen. He's str- I think he's stronger on the mat. Overall, I think he's the one more likely to get a finish. It's just he's unproven, hasn't had a UFC fight, and he hasn't fought in two years. He's had a couple of canceled fights. So for me, I think the higher upside is on Barcelos. I have some more to add to that. I could have some add more, more to add to that, but I'll leave the technical stuff to you guys in the chat, by the way. Auto Roadrunner asked that he didn't see why people are high on Barcelos, and you explain. And that Halaba look styled in, thinks, thinks he looks healthy and the IV stuff was BS. I do agree the IV stuff was BS, but he did do it. He does look a little better at weigh-ins, but that's kind of my thinking on Barcelos. Let's see what the, uh, the two other guys here have to say. Chris, we'll start with you. Yeah, I love it. Arguments in the chat. Let's get some arguments in here. Let's let's really uh, dust it up. But, uh, yeah, I, I like Barcelos as well. I'm I, I'm going to – I'm going to – Add on to your counter striking point a little bit. I think those counters, I think, are lightning quick. His hands are really fast. Um, he can um, also lead pretty quickly when he wants to, but he does seem like a natural counter striker to me. Um, Pablo is definitely aggressive. Will definitely walk you down. So I could see how people like that that pressure, and he definitely got power. Um, I like fighters like that as well. The only problem I see here is that Hollabaloo tends to, um, you know, overextend a little bit in the striking exchanges, especially when he tries to brawl or he thinks he can get somebody hurt. And I think Barcelos can eat him alive um, with with just how much quicker he's going to be and how much power he has. Um, He does have a BJJ black belt. Let me try to check on that because I didn't really see him use any jujitsu in the fights I saw. his wrestling um, defense is held up from what I've seen. And again, you know, it, it's kind of hard because we're kind of go- we're going on incomplete information here. But um, yeah, I, I like Barcelos quite a bit and it uh, wouldn't surprise me at all to see him get a stoppage here. So uh, well, something else I just added in chat is that Barcelos was a little smaller at weigh-ins. He, someone just said much smaller. I would disagree with that. Miles Jerry and Chad Mendes, that was much smaller. That has me a little worried now. This was... There was a size difference, but it wasn't to me massive. And I like the people are on Holaba. Because if I'm wrong, okay, I'm wrong. I missed an underdog. If I'm right, I think that's the potential to, you know, really put me in play up at the top of the leaderboard for some GPPs. Joe, as you can see, I feel pretty strongly here. I'm gonna guess you disagree with me because I can't see all three of us being on Bar- on Barcelona. So I'm just playing the odds. No, I'm gonna go the other way here. You're correct. Um, a couple right. of things. A couple of things to consider here. Um, one, 33 years old, making his UFC debut, um, former LFA, uh, featherweight champ, has not fought in 18 months. Um, I can't find out why I looked, why he hasn't fought in 18 months. He, It looks like he's had a, a couple of canceled fights, one against Kevin Aguilar, who is the current LFA champion, who we just saw in Dana White's Contender Series on Tuesday night. That fight didn't happen, and then he was fighting someone else who apparently got injured, so maybe it was just bad luck. Um, another thing to, to consider is it always worries me when you have a world-class submission grappler who falls so in love with his hands that he doesn't grapple anymore. And that's what we have here with Barcelos. Um, taking all that into account, uh, the fact that, um, you know, Holberg has UFC experience, has been a more active fighter, and likely has his back up against the wall here, and is two years younger um, at 31 – um, I don't love him. I think this is a good fight to target in, um, especially in GPPs. I don't know if I, I would get near this fight in cash because I do see this as finishing inside of the distance one way or the other. Um, it is not a super strong endorsement, 
but I am going to break up the the trifecta here by uh, going the other way. All right, next up, some more name confusion. Saeed Nurmagomedov, 8,500, taking on Justin Scoggins, 7,700. Saeed Nurmagomedov, I believe if I had this right now, I've looked it up the last couple of days, I've, or I've been reading some stuff anyway, is that Habib calls him little cousin, but they're not actually related. That is very, that is correct. That's what I've heard now. No so blood relationship. Been. And he's a very, very different fighter. He is a flashy stand-up guy from what I've seen. Justin Scoggins, on the other hand, is a very good fighter who has the fight IQ of Dirt. dog, ble- dog bleep. <laughs> I was going to start swearing, but I'm going to, I'm going to not for Rotowire. It's not good. So I, I think stylistically Scoggins probably has the advantage, but I, I just can't trust him. I'm going to roster a little bit in GPPs, and I can't go near it in cash. It just If Justin Scoggins is, is who burns me, that's who burns me. I'm not going to fade, but I, I can't risk my day on him. He's going to – when he sh- he'll shoot for something against – he'll shoot sloppy takedowns against guillotine specialists, and he, he's likely to stand and trade with a flashy, you know, a flashy striker. He, he, he takes the fight where it shouldn't go consistently. So that's what I'm thinking on this one. Joe, do you have a, a stronger read on this one? Yeah, I look, this could be the biggest 125-pound pork chop that I've ever eaten. But I, I am going to give Scoggins another chance here. I think stylistically this is a good matchup for him. I, I can't get over how good he looked in a striking matchup with Ray Borg. Um, I don't know that, um, you know, Cousin Khabib is – going to actually force this fight down. I think if it is purely a striking exchange, there is a lot of value to be had um, at 7.7K. Um, so it's 7.7, 8.5, correct? Um, sure. This is a pretty close fight odds-wise. Um, you know, there there is a some odds value in Justin Scoggins. Um, look, I think this is another good fight to target um, for GPPs, but I am uh, I feel a little bit stronger um, about Scoggins than most. And again, I'm going to give him one more chance. Chris Scoggins or Nurmagomedov? Madoff? Uh, I'm I'm going on the one more chance train. I you know I like I like Scoggins a lot. I mean, the fight IQ aside, I mean I, I love how quick he is. He darts in and out with the strikes. He he trains with Wonder Boy, I believe. So he mixes in you know those spinning back kicks and. And all that good stuff, plus the wrestling, I um, you know, I like him quite a bit here. And as for as for the non-relative of uh, of Khabib, um, you know, he does have his grappling. He's a very different grappler, uh, whereas Khabib is, is basically ground and pound. Um, Saeed is more, uh, you know, body lock takedown, and he's very more traditional. He'll he'll pressure and try to you know work to a position. Um, other than that, though, when he's standing in space. I don't really see anything special. I don't think he's going to be able to compete with the speed of Scoggins there. Um, he does have a couple of submissions on his resume, if I'm not mistaken, and that's always, that's always a concern when you go into a Scoggins fight and you're picking him because you never know what Scoggins is going to do. But, uh, but yeah, I, I got to go back to the well here. Um, you know, and if I fall down, it's so be it. But uh, I, I got I to gotta, I gotta judge on tools. I got to judge on tools and matchups, and that's what I'm doing here. And so I'm going uh, Scoggins to turn in a dominant performance. This is crazy. This fight, this this podcast is called Fight IQ, and I'm the only one picking on Fight IQ. Yeah, that's you, guys be, you guys should be embarrassed. You know, <laughs> on, on paper, Scoggins should win the fight. I just maybe I'll come around. I have I have a few more people to talk to, podcasts to do, and we'll see if someone can can sway me to play more Scoggins. But uh-huh. it's not without risk. Yeah, moving on. Alexander Volkanovsky, 9,200, taking on Darren the Damage. I have a shitty tattoo. Elkins at 7,000. Look, Darren Elkins pulls these things off time after time. He's on a win streak most of the time. I think all but one in his win streak. He's been the underdog. He probably shouldn't have been the underdog against Michael Johnson, looking back on it, just stylistically. And I think that one closed up a little bit. Uh, But Volkanovsky, the problem is he's a little bit undersized for this division. Outside of that, the dude is just a killer. Like, take you down, mauls you. He mauled Jeremy Kennedy out of the UFC. Um, very good, Jeremy Kennedy. Look, if Darren Elkins gets in a position against Volkanovski like he did against Mirsad Bektik, 
Bektik is good, but he's not a finisher like Volkanovski. If Elkins gets in trouble in this one, I don't think the heart is going to be enough to pull to pull him through and without the referee stepping in. I think Volkanovski rolls through him. If he doesn't, it's because Elkins has survived. Volkanovski can't keep the pace he generally puts on, and he scores well. Whichever way you go in this fight, I think this is one of the best fights to target on the card regardless. Even if Volkanovski is the most expensive fighter, I think if he wins, he makes value. And if Elkins wins, he clearly makes value. So I like this fight a lot for DFS. I'm on the Volkanovski side. Chris, how about you? Yeah, um, the <laughs> the funny thing is um, Volkanovski on, on the ground looks way more like Khabib than the, the last Nurmagomedov we talked about. Um, he's very much uh, a get you up against get you down, get you up against the fence, and um, really give you vicious ground and pound for uh, three rounds or however long he has to before he gets you out of there. And that's really his game. And, you know, I see people talking on Twitter like, well, how can you be so sure that Elkins isn't going to win because, you know, he does this, this, this a lot, a lot. He comes back. And, I mean, you know, it's, not, it's never really good policy to be on the fighter who has to get his ass kicked a bunch before he wins these fights. Um you know, uh, Michael Johnson was piecing him up on the feet. He got one takedown in space, and that was enough, which might say more about Michael Johnson uh, than it does about him. Um, we all know what happened in his fight before that, where he, he was getting taken down routinely by Mursad Bektic um, in that fight. Perhaps to Bektic's detriment, he probably just should have st- started striking with him. But um, if Volkanovski can do his thing and get takedowns against the fence, then um, Elkins isn't going to have a choice. He's not going to have anywhere to go. And Volkanovski has just shown really good top pressure and ground and pound. And I don't expect Elkins to win. So if Elkins survives, I think that's great because that means Volkanovski is going to have time to accrue more DraftKings points with takedowns and ground and pound. So yeah, I'm heavy. I'm heavy on. Uh, I'm heavy on Volkanovski here. I don't. I don't. I mean, it's a nice story and everything. Elkins keeps coming back. Rah rah rah. Big heart. All that. But um, you know, when we're looking at fights, analyzing it, you got to go with who the better fighter is, and for me, that's clearly Volkanovski. Joe, what do you got? Okay, so if I could be given a little bit of latitude here, there's a iconic comedic character on a very underrated comedy known as WKRP in Cincinnati, if any of you guys might have heard of it. Uh, guy's name is Dr. Johnny Fever. Uh, he was a DJ on the show. He had a police officer come in to give him a reflex test after taking a drink. And to everybody's surprise, with each successive drink, Dr. Johnny Fever's reflexes got stronger, Um, which reminds me of Darren Elkins, because Darren Elkins seems to get better the more he gets hit. Um, And his competition, and this is what worries me a little, I am going to come right out and say I am on the Volkanovski train. However, I do not think it's without risk, because Elkins has fought better competition this is Volkanovski's first fight outside of Australia, New Zealand, um, coming to the U.S., uh, you know, fighting a guy who, you know, look, I don't know if you could get Vegemite in, in Boise. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I am worried a little bit. I mean, Volkanovski has been a prolific scorer on DraftKings. I mean, I think his average points scored are, are you know, 110, 112, something crazy like that. Um, he is the highest price fighter on the board. If you are doing mass entry GPPs, I would certainly say take a few shares of of Elkins. Um, you know, he has surprised, and if he surprises again, um, I don't think it would come as a shock to too many people. But I am picking uh, Volkanovski with the following or the prior caveats. Yeah, I don't think it would it would be totally stunning to see Elkins win just because me making a habit of doing it. But as Chris said last fight, I got to pick on the tools that I could see, and I got to take Volkanovski. Next up, a fight that I think is getting a lot of hype, and I'm actually well, we'll get into it. It's Alejandro Perez at 9100 taking on Eddie Wineland at 7100. Perez is a guy who just finds a way to win. He doesn't have a ton of he doesn't look for takedowns. He doesn't have a ton of volume. I'm picking him to win the fight because I think he's a little better on the feet. But he's not going to score well for DraftKings. I don't think Wineland is totally shot. Um, he, needs a, he needs a knockout to make, to make salary here. And I said, I don't, think, I don't think Wineland is totally done. And with Wineland, with his experience, is live in this fight. 
He, you know, it's hard to look good against John Dodson. Before that, he has got wins over Frankie Signs, which I thought at the time looked good, and Takeo Mizugaki. Before that, I lost to Brian Caraway. Like he's not going out there and and getting hammered. He the last time he was knocked out was 2014. But I don't think he shot. I think it's a close fight. Perez fights close. For that reason, even though I think Perez wins the fight, I'm more interested in Wineland for for DFS. Uh, Joe, how about, how about the take? Oh yeah, dog or pass here. I mean, 9.1k uh, is a crazy price. Um, I think he's still holding at minus 170 uh, on the odds. Um, the, the level of competition is night and day here. Um, you know, like you said, it's it's no embarrassment to lose a decision to John Dotson, who's probably one of the fastest and quickest fighters. Um, he knocked out, uh, he finished Frankie Signs as an underdog, uh, wine limit, that is. He's a full-time fireman, so props for for that. Um, I, you know, Perez, like, his, he's done okay. He's done just enough to win. Um, I think he had a draw against Albert Morales, who's a so-so fighter. So the win streak looks pretty impressive, but not so much based on the level of competition. Um, if Wineland is not totally shot, which I have no reason to believe that he is, I know that in the past, like prior to the Frankie Sons signs fight, he talked about retiring, but it seems like he's he's newly committed. Um, at 7.1K, I, I see some value, some DK value. And this, I think this is one of those fights outside of the women's fights that is fairly likely to go to a decision. So I don't see you getting DK value out of you know, out of Perez, unless he can finish Wineland, Wineland could certainly, you know, get you 10x on a decision win. So for me, it's Dogger Pass um, for DraftKings. Um, and also, I wouldn't feel too comfortable laying minus 170 if I was betting this fight. I would probably take the dog there as well. I know some people who are laying that. Um, making it the uh, trifecta, Chris, you knew a little crazy in Roscoe Alejandro Perez. Well, I do love fights like this because anytime that a guy who isn't supposed to be that expensive is that expensive, nobody's going to play him. So if you play him and uh, he does happen to come through with that knockout, you know, you get all those those points for yourself. But, um, you know, I, I think this fight is kind of close. I mean, Eddie Wineland, we, we all thought he was he was done, right? And then he got um, knockouts over Mitsugaki and, and Frankie Sines, who are two kind of foot slow plotting fighters and then he faces John Dotson who's obviously faster than him and he can't touch him right so um you know I don't think um Perez is on the speed level of a John Dotson of course but he is going to be faster than Eddie Wineland and Eddie Wineland of course does always leave his hands there to be hit and and Perez is a is a tight crisp boxer with uh tight crisp combinations the only thing I would say about um Perez is that he, you know, embraces the firefight a little bit too much. And Eddie Wineland hits very hard. So, you know, could Wineland get a finish? Yeah, of course he could. Um, could Perez get a finish? I don't think it's impossible. Um, I, I, I kind of don't think he's aggressive enough to get one. I mean, the, the reason we saw a finish in, in that um, Matthew Lopez fight is because Lopez gassed badly. Uh, if that didn't happen, I, I don't know if he gets that finish. But he does hit hard, and he is a crisp boxer. So if you're making a bunch of lineups, you want to throw some Perez out there that's, that would put you on the fast track to winning a tournament if he got a finish, most likely, uh, I say go for it. But for the DK play, I think um, the safety net is is clearly uh, uh, Wineland here. Yeah, someone in chat – I should have pulled it up. Uh, I'm sorry if I get your name wrong. It looks like from what I'm looking at it's gamed. Now, funky looking AE, game day AE, I'm going to go with, um, said Wineland cash lock. And I responded in the chat, what I see what you guys think of it. If there was another high price stud that I liked, sure. I don't think you need him. Outside of the, the top is really thin for cash. I think it's more of a mid range week. But if there's people up in that range you really like, I mean, I, I'm fine with playing Wineland and cash. I just don't think you need him. Thoughts on that? No, oh, yeah. I mean, look, I mean, uh, Wineland is 7.1K, right? So that is a pretty attractive price. Um, if you're talking, you know, under 7.5, um, you know, what? You've got Ivanov at 7.5. You've got, um, you know, you've got you've got Elkins. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I could see this fight going to decision. 
I just don't know how many points he's going to score in a decision loss because I don't see Wineland getting a takedown. So I don't know if he has that solid a floor because he's not a wrestler. So, you know, if, if he loses by decision, what's he going to score in a three-round fight? 30? I mean, is he going to get 60, maybe maybe 40? That that would be 80 significant strikes, assuming no takedowns, no not That's a lot in a Perez fight. Yeah, so I, I just don't know. And, and that's the problem. I just don't know what his floor is. Um, I, if you're betting Wineland, if you're taking Wineland in DraftKings, I think you take him under the auspices that you think he's going to win. Not that you think he's going to score, um, you know, get you points for for cash. I just don't. I don't see that as likely an outcome. Yep, I, I we're agreeing here, Joe. But I'm going to quickly quickly break that up because we are up to Marion Renault at 8100, taking on Kat Zingano at 8100. For me, I'm all over Kat Zingano. Ooh. I'm I'm not high on Marion Renault. I never have been. Her last. Joe's going to bring up her last four fights. Five. Her last five. Five. Ashley Evan Smith, let's just concede, she got the loss. She should have won the fight. She did win the fight, but it's Ashley Evan Smith. Milana Dudieva knocked her out in the um, third round. That was a decent performance. I'm not going to not gonna beat her up over that one. The draw against Betch Cohea. That's all I'm going to say. It was a draw against Betch Cohea. She should have won that fight, too. Which she won, which she won by the way. Mm, that was a draw. Yeah, but she won it. I had no, a, she won it. Anyway. 10 8 10 8. Yeah, you got 10 8 by Betch Cohea. No, she should have got a 10 8. No, she should have got it. Flip it. That's right. Flip it. I flipped it in my head. That's, that's the one where Cohea was celebrating and did the little, in the first, in the beginning of the fight, did her little bunny hop over the. Um, yeah, her little game. dance. That's the right. little. Anyhow, Lita Bernardo. Lita Bernardo, that was a close fight. And Lita Bernardo, I don't think is good either. But Bernardo gassed out beyond belief. And that's how Renault got that finish. Sarah McMahon dominated the first round against Renault, but didn't get a finish. And then Sarah McMahon went ahead and did Sarah McMahon things and got a takedown right into side control and then got submitted because that's what Sarah McMahon does. Pat Zingano, I know, has been on a break. She's fighting at a regular interval this time. She's had injuries, personal issues. Caitlin Vieira is a big... Big girl for, 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 for 135, and legit. So was Juliana Pena, which was her last fight. I think both of those fights are better than Renault. I think Zingano is stronger. I think she can get this in the clinch, possibly get a takedown, and I think she is good enough on top to avoid a submission and possibly land some ground and pound. And I'm not going to bank on this one. I think Zingano wins, and I'm clearly more confident than Joe, and Joe will go next. But I actually think of all the women's fights, Zingano's the most likely to get a finish with ground and pound. So that's how I see this one. I'm on Zingano. I don't think it's a popular opinion. Actually, I've seen some people who are behind me. I don't think it's as unpopular as my Barcelo take, but a few hot takes this week for me to choose from. Joe, go ahead and tell everyone why I'm stupid. Yeah, well, you're not stupid. I, I wouldn't go that far. And <laughs> I am I am actually surprised at the love that Kat Zingano is getting here. I mean, let's talk narratives this is the probably the first fight where marion renault has has been able to get a full camp in she is a full-time school teacher right so school is out she got a full camp in she is a high level brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt under a gracie disciple she's got master cadero as her striking coach comes from much better camp than than cats and gano cats and gano has as much as admitted that she is essentially through as a fighter in recent interviews um, she has not looked the same since she had that horrific, and I don't want to go over it. You could watch the Alpha Cat Zingano ESPN thing. I think it was ESPN. She had a real tragedy in her life. She has not looked the same since. Uh, she has not won a fight since Crocs were cool. Um, you know, J James Tahuna. Of all I, the references. I, I used my James Tahuna reference. Yes, she's lost a better competition. Okay, great. Um, I, I look, Marion Renault, I'm not saying she's the greatest fighter in the world. People are making a big deal about her age. She's 41. Kat Zingano's 36. I mean, so we're not talking, you know, and I think there's a lot less wear on Marion Renault than there is on Kat Zingano. If you look at some of the surgeries that she's had and gone through and, you know, the damage to her brain that she, she said on Joe Rogan, um, Marion Renault fights 
well off her back. So if Kat Zingano does take her down, um, I could see, you know, potential for a submission here. Um, of all the female fighters, um, Marion Renault is probably my favorite on this card. Um, I won't go as far as saying this is a great fight to target on DK, but if I was going to play a one of the six female fighters on DK, it would be Marion Renault. Chris, break the die. Yeah, um, I just, I just, I just don't get. I mean, you guys, you guys who like Captain Gano, you saw her last fight, right? I mean, her she, she, she's never looked like the greatest striker. Her striking looked unbelievably bad in that fight. I couldn't. She was overextending on every every single punch. It was just awful. I was wasn't even able. Uh, I'm gonna let you continue in a second. I'm gonna let you finish. All right, guys. But ahead. she's just not gonna need it in this fight. She's gonna close. She she looked bad because she was trying to close the distance and couldn't against a giant Catlin Vieira. I think if she closes the distance here, which is what she always does, she bum rushes in and closes the distance. I think she gets Renault down. Yes, her striking. I will totally concede her striking is not good. All right. Well, even if she gets down, I mean, you can say whatever you want. And yes, Sarah <laughs> McMahon should have defended that triangle better. There's no question. But the fact of the matter is, as soon as she hit the mat, her legs were up and she was going for it. So, you know, if you're not alert and, and you're not, you know, you're not on your A game out there, she's, she's going to catch you, or at least she has a good chance to catch you. And, um, you know, she's, she's a good counter striker. She's a good hard counter striker. That's, Two fights in a row where she's wobbled and put down an opponent with counter strikes. She did it in the Betch fight in that third round, and she did it in in the Sarah McMahon fight. And Sarah McMahon got the desperation takedown, and we went from there. But um, I I really I, I like Marion Renault a lot. I think her striking is solid. I think she she has a, l a little bit of wrestling if she wants to play top game herself. And as Joe said, her jujitsu is is pretty top notch. I think, and I just can't. I just can't look at somebody with no with no striking whatsoever and say, okay, well they're just gonna throw themselves into a takedown and that's gonna be it. Particularly when the other person has jujitsu, I, I just can't do it. Um, I I I have to go Renault here. I think she might get a finish. Um, and so yeah, I'm breaking the tie pretty emphatically there. You guys go ahead and feel free to pick up my head to heads. I'm probably playing Cad Zingano. And cash. I'm I'm very strongly considering it. You, uh, uh, roll up your sleeves. I want to see if there's any needle marks. I mean, <laughs> invites, oh my god! Invites are coming, Sean. Just look out for them. Oof. They're coming. Wow. Okay. Sounds next good. Up, next up, we got Chad Mendez, 8900, taking on Miles Jerry, 7300. This is the one at weigh-ins that caught a lot of people's eyes, including mine, because Miles Jerry is giant compared to Chad Mendez. We're talking about sizes. Sizes. Um, but that's good for a wrestler, though. You want the rest, you want the wrestler to be smaller. Uh, uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. Miles Jerry's looked decent as of late. He made Rick Glenn look really bad. Let's not get hyped up against Mike Delatore because Mike Delatore. The real issue is is you know the narrative Mendes hasn't fought in three years. Pop for for um, I think it was growth hormone. And a and a face cream or something like that. And, and, and a cream and and he he. Looks different. That's that, that's pretty clear. Um, at weigh-ins, but overall, I think he's got the better tools. He's got the wrestling if he goes to it. He hits harder. He's you know he's a wrestler who fell in love with his power. His losses, by the way, you know Frankie Edgar knocked him out in the first round. Frankie Edgar and Conor McGregor. He was beating up Conor McGregor in the first round, and he totally gassed. He did take the, the fight on short notice, and before that, he was beating up Ricardo Lama. So the real issue is the layoff and the size. I think. Oh, this is the one where I had a, we had a comment from Angel. Let me pull it up real quick on Twitter at Angel D three one five. Is Jerry the Felder type chalk this week? Not saying he's going to lose, but if any other under, underdog comes through, Jerry is going to be insanely popular and will need to score hot well at high ownership. How heavy are you guys rostering him? That's one hundred percent accurate take. I think Jerry is the mega chalk this week. I expect most of my head to heads to have him. I think he'll be heavily high owned in tournaments. I think most people are off of Mendez for all those narratives. And that's why I'm going to be playing Chad Mendez in tournaments. Even with this size difference, if Mendez wins, it's through wrestling or a knockout. All things that have high upside. Jury, I'm going to have some exposure to because I can't fade the high ownership. And if he wins, he's cheap enough and he's going to be popular. And not sure what I'm doing with him in cash. 
because he's not going because he's going to be so popular. For me, my decision is going to come down to how much I like Rioni Barcelos and how different I want to be. It's a hard choice to make um, because Barcelos is way more boomer, boomer bust. But I think to answer your question, he will be more more popular. I like Mendez overall, though. So for this one, we'll start with Chris. Yeah, I, I like Mendez too. I um I don't really look. I mean, he he gets knocked out by Frankie Edgar. Uh, he Frankie Edgar was quicker in the pocket and beat him to the punch. Um, the, and of course, the Conor McGregor came and it comes in on late notice. Credit to Conor was doing a lot of early body work in that fight, and I think it, it, it caught up to him. But um, yeah, I, I just think I just think Chad with a, with a full camp here is is going to be look. He's he's going to be the quicker fighter. Um, he's going to have plenty of power. Uh, Miles Jury, as we saw in his last fight, for some reason he likes to grapple even when he shouldn't. Uh, he was beating R Rick Glenn on the feet pretty handily. Kept getting himself into grappling exchanges. Um, ultimately, did get a takedown from him, but you know, gave Rick Glenn much more of a chance in that fight than I think you know he had any right to have. And I think that if he's comfortable there, he might not be able to help himself, even if he knows he shouldn't grapple with somebody like a Chad Mendez. But um, I, I I actually like Mendez a lot here. I think um, Jerry's good. He, he has good kicks, good body kicks and leg kicks, but of course, that can be takedown fuel, um, so we'll have to see how he responds there. I think a lot of people will be off of Mendez just because of, you know, the break and the last two fights are losses, and they're both stoppages, and, you know, as Joe would say, narratives. But uh, but I'm, I'm going to be pretty heavy on Mendez. As you said, uh, Sean, you can't fully fade uh, Jerry no matter where you are because he can win this fight, and he's going to be so heavily owned that if you completely fade him, and he wins, he's going to ruin your night. But I'm going to have um, more Mendez. I have a feeling I'm going to be very overweight to the field, and I think it's going to pay off. God, me and Chris are, are agreeing. I'm either going to – we're going to win together or I'm going to lose a crap ton of money. Best Joe? buddy. <laughs> yeah, right now. Let's we'll see, we'll see what happens next. No, look, I'm going to complete the trifecta here. I am concerned about, you know, the layoff, um, although I have to believe – that, you know, there are plenty of, of wrestlers uh, at Alpha Male, um, you know, where, where Mendez does his camp um, to get him ready for this fight. He, he actually looked good um, at, at the stare down. Um, you know, he looked in shape. Um, you know, I don't think that, I, I don't know, but I don't think that, you know, it was a, a pure, you know, doping violation. I believe it, it truly was, you know, some cream that he was using for his, Baser, you know, I don't think he he was a juicer. Um, I don't know that for a fact, but um, he looked pretty good um, at 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 the stare downs. Um, the size advantage. Look, if he was a striker, it would bother me a lot more as a wrestler. I kind of actually like the guy with the lower center of gravity. Um, you know, to get takedowns. Um, he is expensive at eight point nine k. So so the, the good news though is that his floor would be a bit higher than. Um, some others on the card, uh, if the fight goes to decision, because you are looking for, you know, takedown and grappling points through advances, you know, reversals. Um, Miles Drury is not a bad, uh, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu fighter. He's got his own style of black belt. Um, you know, there's been some controversy around his black belt, but um, he's not a bad, doesn't, he does have a black belt in BJJ. Um, obviously, the, the stand-up, um, he does have a reach advantage, but I don't think um, he's going to be able to use it. I see Mendez getting in his face and grinding on him, getting him taken down. I hope he has the gas. I mean, look, he won that first round against Conor McGregor. Um, you know, when they fought, um, he took that fight on short notice and then ended up gassing. Um, yes, got got knocked out very badly by Frankie Edgar. But if he's back um, and in shape, I think I like him in this fight. So that's uh, three, three for three with Mendez. Interesting, because I think we are. From what I've seen, jury is the popular play this week. But next up, Randy Brown, 8,300, taking on Nico Price, 7,900. Brown, taller at stare downs. I still think he gets the crap beat out of him. I like Nico Price a bunch this week. I have a bet on Nico Price. I think Randy Brown, he gets taken down. He's on his back. He has no clue what to do. I think he's the more athletic guy. I think Price is the more technical and should have a big advantage on the ground. So I like Nico Price without overanalyzing. I'll leave it you guys, Joe Price or Brown? Okay, so I went back and forth on this fight. I started out 
liking Price, and then I watched him against George Sullivan and felt that Sullivan had way too much success against Nico Price. Um, Randy Brown, on the other hand, um, your point is valid about him being on his back. However, he's got a 71% takedown defense. So I think Price is going to have to work to get him on his back. Um, I could certainly see Brown, um, you know, outstriking Nico Price. I don't see Nico Price as being great anywhere. Um, he's good in a couple of areas. Um, I think he's going to be very popular at 7.9K. There are a lot of people that like him um, that can't really say why. Um, I, I, you know, look, I think this is a great fight to target in GPPs. I do think Brown is going to be underowned for that reason. He's attractive to me. He's what, 8.3? Uh, 8.3 versus 7.9. So I do kind of like Brown a little bit here, but I will have, you know, I will have a fair amount of price in mass entry GPPs, but I am flip-flopping and uh, changing my pick to Brown. Trust your gut, Joe. Trust your gut. Or in this case, let's let Chris break the tie. Uh, I have not flip-flopped. I am firmly on Brown here. I think yeah, um, exactly. I'm actually happy about this. I think um, I, I think Price is, is going to struggle with the with the length with the longer fighter. I mean, for all for all the the accolades and hype that Price gets as an action fighter and his fights have been action fights, what he really wants to do be is a counter striker. He likes to sit back and pop that jab, and you know take it from there. And um, you know, Vicente Luque really really cut the space off and really gave him nowhere to go. And um, he was basically a sitting duck, um, body work, leg kicks, the whole, the whole, the whole thing. I think, um, I think Randy Brown is, is very toolsy. I think he can fight long. I think he's got good, powerful body and leg kicks. Um, he's got a little bit of wrestling, as we saw in that uh, the Mickey Gall fight. Even though he should have been using it there, he does have it. Um, I, I don't know. You know, I, I just, I just, I'm not a huge fan of, of Nico Price. I think. I think he's an overperformer. I think um, Brown is a better athlete. I think he's a better technical striker. And I think Brown is going to have the pace that he wants in this fight. And I think it's going to lead to a stopping. All right. Next up, Dennis Bermudez, 9,000, taking on Rick Glenn at 7,200. Bermudez has his, has his proverbial backup against the wall. Three straight losses. was knocked out by Korean Zombie. You know, lost against Darren Elkins, a close split decision, and lost, I believe, another split decision against Andre Feely in a really fun fight um, where he landed 103 strikes, got a takedown, scored 60 points in a loss. I like Bermudez here. I think he can, he can get takedowns on Rick Glenn. I think he's overall just the better fighter pretty much wherever this, wherever this fight goes. I think he can get takedowns. I think he could have some success in the feed. Miles Jerry exposed Rick Glenn. We know Bermudez needs to fight. I, I think he'll go back to his wrestling. I, I, I'm i liking Bermudez the more I talk about it with people. So I'm on Bermudez. Chris? Yeah, I'm heavily on Bermudez here. I mean, I think Rick Glenn is basically a punching bag. Um, the, the the one fight he won in the UFC against that prospect kid. I Gavin Tucker. Name, Gavin uh, Tucker. Tucker, yeah. uh, Tucker was beating him, and Tucker just gassed out and allowed uh, allowed Glenn to take over that fight. Um, look, that's how that's how he wins fights. Um, as we were talking about in the comment section, um, you know he's he's a tough he's a tough dude, and he can wrestle, and he's got some meat and potatoes boxing. But um, none of that is going to be enough for Bermudez, who's better everywhere. He's much quicker. I think his his wrestling is much better. Um, I think he's he he hits for more power. Although I think Glenn has some power of his own. I I just I just see Bermudez getting a finish here. And I, I think this is a pretty easy fight for him. It's certainly the easiest fight for him he's had in, in quite some time. So I'm going Bermudez uh, decisive. So trifecta? Yeah, trifecta here. The one caution that I would give is that the odds that this fight goes the distance is minus 300, which tells me that Brown is, a, I'm sorry, Bermudez is a much better play for cash and single entry GPPs. I would be very surprised if this fight goes to decision that you see Bermudez on the winning lineup in a mass entry GPP. Um, so I would just, you know, preach that caution. I see Bermudez as more of a cash slash single entry GPP play. Um, unless he does finish 
um, Glenn, which, you know, he could because, to Sean's point, his back is up against the wall. But um, I do like Bermuda as a fair amount here. All right, let's move on. And we are up to the main event. And the one that I think gets people the most heated just because it is Sage Northcutt at 8,400 taking on Zach Otto at 7,800. I have strong takes on both these fighters. Sage Northcutt, and, and I know some people out there are going to – let me play out the whole my, – my whole thought here. Sage Northcutt reminds me of Jake Matthews. Not in that they're grapplers or he's going to go out and, you know, and have as successful a career as Matthews or fight the same way. It's that people are all over Sage Northcutt, you know, giving him all kinds of crap. He's 22 years old and he's 5-2 and two in the UFC. People are all over Jake Matthews. And Matthews had surgeries on top of it. At some point, I think Sage's a good enough athlete and has been training long enough, and he's good enough at this, that I think he's going to have that breakthrough moment. Whether it's here or not, I can't be sure. He is 0-2 at 170, taking on Zach Otto. Didn't look undersized at, at weigh-ins at all. He is a growing kid for what it's worth. It's crazy that I can call someone 22 a kid, but that's how I feel these days. Northcutt. Actually, back up. Otto, on the other hand, I think is incredibly overrated. I I think, but to put it in perspective, I think so little of Zach Otto. I took a shot on Mike Pyle because <laughs> Mike Pyle doesn't have a chin, and that's what held up. But I thought if Pyle's chin could make it through one more fight, he could beat Zach Otto. That's just how little I think of Otto, a guy who went to a split decision against Josh Berkman. He's not going to look for takedowns. He only two takedowns in the UFC were against Kiechi Kunamoto, which was also a split decision win. I, I just don't think Zach Otto is very good. Great guy. I think he's he's a former Marine, tough dude. But I think Sage is going to have the speed in this one, a little bit of explosiveness. If anyone's going to look for a takedown, I think it's Sage. I'm not convinced it scores well, but I like Sage as the pick here. Yo? Well, you stole my thunder a little bit because I was going to say I don't think this is a great fight to target, you know, for DK, um, you know, quick, quick antidote, you know, we did my, you know, we did our creating alpha pod, Brett Appley and I earlier. And, you know, one of the questions we got was of the six female fighters, which one do you think is the hottest? And someone chimed in and said, Sage Norcutt. <laughs> <laughs> um, you well, know, so, so yeah, <laughs> muscles, yeah, great. Um, oh, and two at welterweight. Um, you know, I'm a little concerned. I just honestly don't know if Sage has the work ethic. I mean, a lot, a lot of is being made of his time at Alpha Male. Um, Sage spent some time up in TriStar and could not actually cut the two a days at TriStar, so he left TriStar. Um, again, he's young. He's certainly subject to improvement. Uh, it's interesting because Zach Otto's got so few takedowns, yet he's got ten submission wins which is almost counterintuitive. Um, honestly, yeah, I mean, we're not doing hot takes yet. I, I think if that goes to this, I do see Zach Otto as maybe having a better path to a finish, which is kind of, I guess, a bit of a hot take. Um, I but again, it's very hard. I don't think this is a great fight to target. I mean, look, we've seen what happens to Sage when he gets on the ground. Nothing that I have seen or heard has, you know, that Sage has improved his ground game. You know, speed, maybe, you know, going for takedowns, but I think it would be a mistake if he tries to take Zach Otto down. I think he should try to keep this fight standing. Um, but I think I'm going to have a little bit of each um, in mass entry GPPs, but I don't know that this is a super great fight to target. Chris, what do you feel about our co-main event? Yeah, uh, apologies if you guys just heard that. I was on Sure Dog and, and an ad started talking to me. So I don't know if you guys heard that, but that's what that is. Um, I um, I long for the days when we'll stop referencing Sage Northcutt's age when talking about how he's going to do in a fight. Because it used to be that uh, he was only 19. and he's so 22. He's and now he's only, yeah, but how long? Oh, he's only he's only thirty four. I mean, that's, that's no, not so dude, bad. Dude, you can't. He's twenty two. You can't say this when he's twenty two. But him till he's twenty four, twenty five. Still fight years. No, you have to grow into. You years. have to grow into your body. You absolutely have to grow into it. I'm not letting this one go. This is where I'm. I'm taking the lead instigator. There's, there's. I get your point. We've been saying it forever, and it is annoying. But he's twenty two. Cut. I know, and he'll be, and he'll be twenty five, and you'll be saying the same thing. But anyway. 
Anyway, anyway, um, I I just I I just don't um know what Sage plans on doing with his fight career. To me, he looks very much like someone who's learning a bunch of new stuff with Alpha Male and hasn't put it together yet uh, because he's only 22. But he just looks very <laughs> much like he just looks very much like somebody who it's like okay, I have striking, but now I got to mix in the wrestling, and and now I got got to throw combinations, but also I go back to my karate point fighting stuff. The the takedowns he goes for um, seem very cosmetic to me. Uh, most mostly they they seem to occur at the end of rounds just to try to ice rounds, which doesn't seem which seems to be working less and less in general in, in MMA, which I think is a good thing. But um, I think I don't I don't refer to a lot of fights as robberies because I I usually think that most fights are eh, they're close enough. But I mean, say Cut, I think his last fight against Guti was a robbery. I think he got badly hurt at least three times in that fight. Should have lost it. Um, and that's because his, his guard is very open. It's sort of your typical, still your karate thing with like this. Um, and when he tries to strike, he just leaves himself open to be hit. And Zach Otto is, uh, is he, I want to say he's an accomplished boxer. Is he golden gloves or something? I think there's some, there's some kind of boxing a- accolade that he has. But anyway, you can see that, that he's a pretty accomplished striker. He's got a nice high guard. Um, he can throw in combinations. He, he has some power, um, he, even though Mike Pyle doesn't have a chin and he doesn't. Um, he does have power. Um, he couldn't, wait, 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 wait. He couldn't knock out Josh Berkman. Uh, he's got power. Yeah, Come yeah on. But, you know, it, just because some guy doesn't finish somebody every fight don't mean they don't have power. I mean, the guy the guy is hard when he lands. I, I mean, you know, I, I hope he shows you. Maybe he'll show you. But, uh, he, he could knock out Sage. Well, well, that's what that's what I mean. I mean, I mean, Guti almost did it like four times. I mean, what are we talking about here? But uh, yeah, I just, I, I, I think, like I said in the beginning, Sage is somebody who is really just trying to put his game together. And against uh, a guy, a guy with a crisp boxing game who knows what he wants to do in there, I think that's dangerous. I think he's gonna, he might get caught staring a little bit in this fight, and I think Otto's gonna make him pay. Uh, as far as the finish goes. I'm I'm not a hundred percent on that. Uh, we saw that 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 Sage can take a shot for all the people ragging on his toughness uh, when he lost the Barbarina fight. I do think he has a de- fairly decent chin, but I wouldn't put a finish past Otto here either. I think um, he can be aggressive here. I think his he's gonna um, pressure Sage, and I'm, he's gonna get the kind of fight he wants. So I mean, we're gonna see, but I definitely like Otto to win the fight. In, in fairness to Sage, he did have strap throat during that. Barbarina fight. That was a fight at the Prudential Center in Newark. And after the fight, like he went to the doctor and Dana White even came out and said he shouldn't have let Sage have that fight because he did. Have yeah, to no, I, I'm not I'm not ragging on him for that. No. If anything, I, I think he's being unfairly maligned for that. So no, I, you know. I, I think I think that if he gets finished, it's going to be on the ground by submission. I don't necessarily see him getting knocked out, at least not by Zach Otto. But, you know, I, I do tend to agree with you that it's not beyond the realm of possibility that Zach Otto could sub him. All right. We are up to our main event. And it's a main event that I don't have a ton of interest in in terms of watching, but a, a lot for DFS. Junior Dos Santos, 8,700, taking on Bulagoy, even off at 7,500. Look, Dos Santos is bigger. He's faced better competition. Blagoy for me, carries his hands too low. I know he's a Sambo guy, but he doesn't bring a ton of pressure. It's not, he's not going to make JDS move backwards. I think Dos Santos finishes him as long as he's not a totally shot fighter. And I don't think he is, but I'm going to have tons of JDS and kind of not go too much further than that. Chris, our main event, bring us home. Yeah, um, I, I hate to end on an agreement even after the last one was uh, so contentious, but yeah. I pretty much have the same the same feeling as you. Um, we we all know what uh, JDS's bugaboo is at this point. He circles himself against the fence and gets stuck there. Um, not only did he do it in the Mjolcic fight, which he paid for, he also did it in the Rothwell fight. And Rothwell couldn't make him pay. And I think this fight's going to look a lot more like the Rothwell fight than it did the Mjolcic fight because um, Mjolcic has pretty fast hands for a heavyweight. Um, Ivanov does not. Um, and as you said, Ivanov doesn't really pressure. Um, he's 
He's very open to, to letting the fight go where his opponent wants it, letting his opponent take the center. And if you do that against JDS, um, he's just going to box you up. Uh, I, I love JDS. I love his combination punching. I love his body work. He added that low calf kick last time, which ultimately didn't end up working, but was hurting Miocic, which is part of the reason why he pressured so much in that fight. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not I'm not overly impressed by Ivanov. Um, I think JDS uh, beats him pretty much wherever. It's not out of the question that Ivanov can put him against the fence and land a big shot, but this is a fight that I have to see Ivanov win before I can say that he wins it. So I'm going with JDS by stoppage here. Joe, what's your thoughts on the main event? Well, I, I, I'll i be honest, and I have not – I don't know if I've ever gotten a Junior Dos Santos fight right, going back to his fight with Cain Velasquez, his first fight with Cain Velasquez. Um, I was at the fight um, when he got KO'd by Alistair Overeem. That was my first UFC event in Orlando. Um, I was um, on Ben Rothwell when he boxed up Ben Rothwell for five rounds. And, um, you know, I gave him a shot against Stipe when, when Stipe finished him. So I just don't know what Junior Dos Santos we're going to get. Um, Ivanov, on the other hand, has never been finished, never been knocked out. Um, he is a tough Bulgarian mother, um, got, got, I think, knifed in a bar fight or something and was in ICU for a number of months and, you know, came out of that. Um, you know, I, if the junior Dos Santos that, that fought um, Ben Rothwell shows up, yeah, I, I, I'm on board. Um, but, you know, if this is a, a junior Dos Santos who, again, is coming off a layoff, right, um, is not that same guy. Um, is the guy that lost to Stipe, is the guy that got his ass whipped by Alistair Overeem, um, you know, fighting a tough guy who has never been finished, who whose claim to fame is actually having beaten Fedor in a Sambo, a Sambo match, Sambo match. Um, I don't know, man. I, I am less, I, I will make JDS my official pick, but I am not as confident as either one of you guys. All right, so that's what we got for the fight-by-fight fight breakdowns. Let's uh, do our hot takes and get out of here. I'll start with the hot takes this week. I have, I have a couple to pick from, but I'm the one I feel a little better about, especially because I just, I just disagree with the Vegas line a lot. Rione Barcelos finishes Kurt Hollibaugh. Anybody got one ready? We'll start with we'll go to Chris. Put you on the spot. All right, put me on the spot. I'm going to say that um... – it's a, it's a bad day for relatives and last name, but non-relatives alike. I think uh, Maya, Garcia, and Ramagomedov all pick up L's here. You bet that parlay. I don't hate that other than... <laughs> I might. I just might. Joe? Okay. So I, I guess um, I'm going to go back to my... Uh, what I alluded to as potentially being a hot take. Uh, Zach Otto... Uh, Finishes Sage Norcut. Whew, that is that qualifies because I, I have a hard time so. seeing auto finishing. And Chris would love that. Yeah. Love that. So, guys, thanks for joining us again. If you're not watching these on on YouTube, we do them live eight o'clock Eastern time. Um, if if you are watching on YouTube now, go ahead. We also um, these go to the Rotowire MMA podcast on iTunes. I think it's on SoundCloud, but I know it's on iTunes. Go ahead and uh, subscribe to the Rotowire MMA podcast. Support us that way. Go to rotowire.com slash free, 10-day free trial, no credit card required for all their premium content. Guys, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, Sunday the- card next week. Just reminder, Hamburg, Sunday card next week. Uh, we will nice. post up. Uh, I don't think there's any reason to believe we're going to do this differently, but we will post up any uh, potential changes to times, but I guess everyone can just assume we'll be going on at 8 on Friday, but it is a Sunday card because it is in Germany. Yeah, we keep losing fights in that freaking card, so I'm, yeah, a, little worried. I'm a little worried about it. Yeah. So, but we will have a card. You don't know how good it will be, but it is a fight pass card. So I think it's a fight pass card. Is it? Oh, it makes sense. I'm you hoping it's have... a fight. I'm hoping it is so that the pacing is better. Oh, if not, pacing will be great. Please, please, please. If not, we'll suffer through an FS1 card together, and I'll see you guys presumably on Friday to break it down. Guys who are watching, listening, good luck in your contest. We will see you all for UFC Hamburg. Peace out.